and while fighting to improve oneself and being the best version they can be is beautiful and everyone should strive to reach these heights, there is a dark side to chasing ambition and being the best in the world of fighting. Joe Yabuki, Kimi wa ashita wo shinjite iru no ka? Huh? Tobok san nara ashita nado wa nai hazu da. Sono round de best o tsukusanai kagiri next round wa konai. Chigau ka Joe Yabuki? The path of a fighter comes with a cost. To be the best, you must walk through hell. A destructive path that will harm you, your opponents, and those around you physically, mentally, and emotionally. While I framed Ippo in the positive light of the sport and what it stands for, plenty of the things I'm going to bring up in this segment can also be applied and happens in the story of Hajime no Ippo. To be the best at something, especially a competitive sport, it takes a very specific personality to achieve these heights that very few reach. You can view it as much of a character or personality flaw as much as you can view it as a positive character or personality trait. Documentaries like The Last Dance show the psychotic lengths Michael Jordan went to push himself to be the best, doing things that if he did not exist in the context of the greatest to ever touch his sport, he would be viewed as an insane person and his actions would be unacceptable. The path of a boxer is a lonely one, especially if you are an elite level fighter. To be the best, you are inevitably going to push those around you away. Your hyper-competitive mindset and expectations cannot be met by your peers and cannot be understood by your loved ones. At the top, everyone is your enemy inside the ring and out. You will be flocked by parasites looking to leech off you, trying to line their pocket as much as they can before your shelf life as a fighter expires. Then they toss you to the side and move on to their next prey. You and your opponents are both weighed down by your life experiences and traumas to make any connection. You are mortal enemies trying to take away each other's lives livelihoods and everything you fought for up until this point. These relationships can be viewed as a simplification of the larger expectations a man must take on and be like in society. This expectation of what being a man is really like. Someone who is tough. Someone who doesn't complain. Takes his lumps. You know, the generic shit you've heard all of your life. And in reality, all that does is make you emotionally stunted and shut off. Someone shielding themselves under so many layers of irony, parody, and self-deprecation that it is hard to find out what you really feel and who you really are. Someone who doesn't know how to truly express themselves and can't cope or manage any difficult situation, especially ones that require you to grapple with how you feel and be open about your insecurities. It's why we see these types of characters so quick to violence and anger. Joe often uses his bursts of anger and a real mean part of himself as a coping mechanism to shield himself from the facts of life he doesn't want to acknowledge, accept, or grapple with. It's why Joe constantly constantly gets into fights with Yoko and is genuinely really mean to her at times because she sees Joe for who he really is. She is able to see past the mask and hard exterior to find a young man riddled with grief and trauma and isn't as strong as he wants to be or make everyone around him think he is, failed by the system lost in this world for most of his life and has been set up to be unable to truly express himself because of it. These insecurities and inferiority issues cause a great sense of shame and embarrassment in Joe. He he can't hide from Yoko. So when Joe is metaphorically backed into a corner and exposed for who he really is, he does what he knows best, gets violent, and fights against it. There is no scene to exemplify this better than when Carlos shows up after the Hari Mao fight, and when Yoko tries to walk in, he explodes in anger and doesn't want her to see him. He doesn't want someone who he loved and held in high respect to be seen in such a broken and pitifully compromised position. And it's not even far-fetched for why Joe acts like this. We don't even have to look at fiction and can instead view the real world of combat sports and see how fans suffer in silence, crying laughing face. Bro's never faced adversity in his life and it's showing in the amount of shit posts since he had strep throat and a deviated septum. Chill. Fellow fighters. I haven't talked to him about it or asked him because I don't, um, I mean, you know, he lost or whatever, so I don't talk to losers. You were on welfare, bro. Okay, then Who you ain't no man. You took welfare. Okay, don't then, talk, then don't what, talk then about what, money. Don't you talk happened, about then, money. Then, then, you then took, wasn't it you took money from there. single moms. Single moms go on welfare, not men. And the media treat those who open up and show vulnerability. But here he is, three years later, so I have to salute him. Salute him for pulling off one of the great scams in boxing history, which, trust me, is saying a lot. 
Yes, his first return fight, he weighed 267. Here he is three years later, 263. You've heard of the diet formula. What is it, Slim Fast? Slim I think fast. George has developed Slim Slow. They are ridiculed. Their masculinity is questioned. It becomes the focus of insults for the sake of hyping up fights. You are viewed as weak and lesser. You complain. You make excuses for having mental problems, emotional problems, and addictions. It is this illogical, unfair, unspoken rule and expectation that these are things you are just supposed to tough through because you are a man. I think the way we view fighters is twisted and broken. Lose a fight? You're worthless. Treated like trash. Corrupt politicians get talked about in a more flat flattering light than someone who just lost their match. Win a fight even, and if it's not convincing enough, then you're washed up, over the hill, too old to keep competing, time for you to retire, etc. Revisionist history of your career and accomplishments happen left and right, your competency is in question, and suddenly everything you've done so far is by pure luck. You've been fighting nothing but tomato cans. You haven't fought a real opponent. You were overrated. You were never good. The competition wasn't stacked. Fighters have to be perfect in the eyes of those who can't even fathom what hell it must be to go through to make weigh-ins, be in shape to fight, or even enter the ring. It's why so many fighters are undefeated nowadays, with padded stats and the almost complete disappearance of super fights, especially when both fighters are in their prime, and you could thank all of that to Floyd Money Mayweather. This whole ethos is summarized perfectly by the title of the amazing documentary Fighting in the Age of Loneliness, which I cannot recommend enough. After just reading the title before even seeing the film, those words struck something inside of me, and I was was unable to stop thinking about them. It sparked my mind to run wild, building my own interpretations of these words, creating their own stories based on them, and the endless imagining of how they can be recontextualized into everything I've thought up until now. And this is just from reading the title in my YouTube recommendation feed. I believe that the age of loneliness is a constant and is truly timeless. Times change, the state of the world and our views of it change, societal standards change, but fighting in the age of loneliness has stayed the same. Man is crushed by the weight of the world and its cruel and unjust nature, fighting because they have to, because it's all they know, because it's all they can do, because it's all they have left. Born from nothing, crawling their way to the top at the cost of everything, being taken advantage of because those around them don't have their best interests in mind, seeing people become their self-made heroes, taking life into their own hands and reaching their dreams is inspirational. But maybe there is something wrong with how so many of our champions and those we respect. All have similar upbringings, similar starts. Maybe there is something fundamentally broken that is breeding these types of heroes, and maybe we shouldn't praise the fact they came from nothing and analyze why so many do. And this is why I think the age of loneliness is timeless. Ashtono Joe was written between 1968 and 1973, yet so many of its talking points and themes feel so tangible, real, and applicable today 55 years after its publication. Even completely detached from the writer, his background, and the entire ecosystem he wrote it in. And because of all of this, Joe grows into becoming an icon and shepherd for the lost and directionless in this age of loneliness. If you somehow missed this fact, the show beats you over the head with it in the most blunt and in-your-face way possible in episode 44 at the restaurant with all of the guys Joe met in the juvenile correction center. Joe is their hero and hope. He shows that it is still possible to achieve something great even if you have been failed and abandoned by the world around you. It also allegedly inspired a real-life plane hijacking, but it and its validity is a story for another day. And we can see how this hope has been passed down and inspired those of the future generations, directly in outright confirmed admissions or otherwise. I truly believe there is a solid through-line from Joe to characters like Guts, Solid Snake, and Kiryu even if I don't have any hard evidence to prove it. The thing all all of these characters have in common is that their struggles and journeys inspire those who witness them, pushing them to strive for their best and fight back against this age of loneliness, which I think that all of us have been exposed to to some extent. And that is because the art of fighting and battling against the age of loneliness has no borders and does not discriminate. Everything I've just mentioned is why when there is a genuine friendship and connection made in this world of fighting, it is something extremely special and irreplaceable.
そんな俺の力士と俺のためにもお前なんかには負けられねえんだええー、のWho can understand them and they could express themselves to in a way that still aligns with societal expectations and within the comfort of their own boundaries and emotional hang ups. It's what the understanding a man through his fists, the silent communication through fighting one another trope you see all over media, especially Japanese media, is all about. It's why the spark shines so bright when they find someone who can understand them and how they feel in ways they aren't able to verbalize or even show by actions, and why it's so. Devastating to feel the loss of someone you felt truly understood you and could relate to you. Joe comes off more torn up about Nishi having to retire than he is, breaking down into tears and refusing to accept that the man has a career ending injury. At this point, Joe has already lost Rikishi. In his eyes, he's losing another compatriot in the world of boxing, someone he felt he shared a connection with. But inversely, in a positive light, their connection and mutual respect for each other is what allowed Joe to go. Go all out in their final spar, fulfilling Nishi's wish, letting him retire with no regrets and having the best final three minutes of his fighting career. I don't even think that this is that big of a reach or projection because you can see this in other popular boxing media like Rocky. The entirety of Rocky 3 is him overcoming the grief of losing Mick, with his world falling apart around him as he is exposed to the truth. Who he has been fighting to defend the belt haven't been the strongest of competition, they have been actively protecting. Protecting his title and placement, with Apollo Creed picking Rocky back up and rebuilding him into the champ everybody knows he is. Then the entirety of Rocky IV is grappling with the death of Apollo Creed and how Rocky could have prevented it. The man who was once his enemy growing to be his closest friend and companion dying in his arms because he wanted to go out as a fighter and could not accept that Father Time had caught up to him and the era of Apollo Creed had passed. Hell, it doesn't even have to be boxing. The term bromance. Exists for a reason. Every dude out there needs a bro who can get them. Ride or die companions. Rikishi and Carlos help Joe grow and strive for the better and bring out the best within him. Rikishi and his will to fight Joe despite the physical toll and hell he needed to go through drove Joe to keep getting up versus Kim and why he was so determined to stay in the bantamweight division even if his body actively fought against him from doing so. Carlos and his loss in the title fight lit an obsessive Fire in Joe to do nothing but beat Jose Mendoza and claim the world champion belt at all cost by any means necessary. Joe idolizes and puts Rikishi on such a pedestal that even in his fight versus Jose Mendoza, battling for the belt to be the bantamweight champion of the world, all he could think about is Rikishi. Unlike in the rest of the show, in Joe's hallucinations here, Rikishi appears before him in perfect condition. No longer is he seen in this emaciated form that claimed his life. He is the ideal form of himself with the belt around him, and we see Joe be the happiest he has been in the entire series, getting the thing he's always dreamed of and always wanted yet was denied by fate. But for as good and as nice as all of these things are, the sad reality and truth of combat sports like boxing is that to compete, you are actively harming your body and brain, making your later years in life actively worse if you even manage to make it that long. In the world of fiction, stuff like this can be ignored, and we can happily see the main characters overcoming adversity and winning the belt without having to think about the horrors of CTE. But not every story shies away from this truth, and when they make it a focal point, Point of their series, it only makes it all the more horrifying and heart wrenching. The first cost. 
worst of a fighter's path is isolation and loneliness. The second is their bodies. Along Joe's journey, pretty much every fighter he encounters or faces is left crippled from life-altering injuries, emotionally broken, or outright dead. This is the life of a boxer. For them, there is no tomorrow. They burn bright for a short period of time before there is nothing left but white ash. Because of the horrible things that befalls these fighters is at the hands of Joe. His spiral into depression and unstableness only gets more and more severe. It's something even built on more in the anime, exploring Wolf's character and his relationship with Joe. Because of his jaw injury from their fight, he falls in with the Yakuza since he can't compete, and then later borrows money from Joe under the guise of helping out the gym he works at that is run by his fiancé's father. But Joe later finds out that Wolf doesn't work there and disappears with the money. Joe finally opens his heart for a little after Rikishi's death and is instantly taken advantage of. And he can't help but feel guilty because Wolf is like this because of what Joe's punch did to his jaw. This ever-present truth of destruction continues to eat away at Joe throughout the story, even if he tries to block it out, numb himself to it, or act like it doesn't bother him. All this does is make Joe more distant and increases the weight the guilt of Carlos, Rikishi, Nishi, Kim, Leon, and so many more hurt even more. Eventually, it gets to the point where it's too much to ignore, and this is where the cost of alienation comes back to collect its dues. Joe's loved ones can only stand to see him put his body through such punishment and beg him to stop before he gets himself killed. They cannot understand why he keeps fighting if it means he is gambling with his life to such a dangerous degree like those before him did. This is where the personality flaw that enables elite-level athletes to be the best comes back to rear its ugly head. For as much as Rikishi and Carlos help push Joe forward, they equally weigh him down from their tragedies, eventually turning into unhealthy obsessions. With Rikishi, it's chasing his ghost and continuing to fight, and with Carlos, it's beating Jose Mendoza at all costs with reckless abandon. Upon introspection a while ago, I realized that a recurring theme that is present and a pivotal part of the stories that would go on to be my favorites all feature obsession. Against all logic, care of personal well-being, both mental and physical, Joe continues to fight. Why? because something possesses him deep down to his very core that drives him to keep going. A smarter man would simply stop getting into the ring after the destructive journey he has taken and witnessed so many others follow, with all of his peers either being dead or broken, especially given the condition of Joe's body by the end of the story. No man in their right mind in his position should have and would have got in the ring to fight Jose Mendoza, but that is what is poetic about Joe and so many of my favorite characters. They aren't smart. They still do it anyway, and like Joe vowed to do, he made this fight the greatest day of his life and fought until there was nothing more and nothing left but pure white ash. Regular people are unable to understand what keeps Joe pursuing these destructive, dangerous dreams and desires. Don Pei is brought to tears multiple times throughout Joe's regiment, especially during the dangers of weight cutting to fight Kim, going as far as to trick him by replacing the weights on the scale with lighter ones that look the exact same, thus sabotaging the weigh-in so Joe would not push his body to its absolute limit and kill himself in order to cut the weight. Betraying the trust that he worked so hard and took so long to build with Joe all for his own good, even if this results in irreparably damaging their relationship because he can't understand. Yoko is begging Joe in tears before his final fight to not go out there. His body is past the point of being broken, riddled with CTE. He will die if he gets in that ring. I fully expect that most people viewing this video will not and cannot conceive and understand just how important these scenes were to me. These themes of obsession, determination, and pursuing one's dreams against all logic and reason has electrified me down to my very core. It puts into words and visuals something that I have felt has been truly unarticulatable for me. As someone who has given up on every hobby, career, or skill set I've ever attempted to learn once I reached a plateau and couldn't see myself improving anymore, not knowing how to, with things getting too tough, being too scared and ashamed to admit to myself and others that I wasn't perfect and did not know what to do, be it voice acting, 
boxing, drawing, animating, guitar, piano, getting into shape, learning languages, etc., YouTube has been the only thing I've ever managed to stick with. It is the thing I have kept pursuing in a hypnotic trance, unable to stop. YouTube is genuinely the greatest thing to have ever happened in my entire life. Every day I am thankful I get to do this and was able to escape my dead-end job because of it. But YouTube is also the single biggest source of stress and anxiety in my life, and I feel like it is actively and slowly killing me to some extent. YouTube is a job that requires long hours that don't guarantee results for your efforts. It's a job that pushes me further into isolation and makes me feel like I can't relate to anyone around me anymore. Even if they say they understand, unless they actively live it, I do not believe they can. And then there is the guilt of feeling this way and the response that me and people in similar positions get, saying that we don't have a right to complain because you have a dream job others would kill for, or how you're just making stupid YouTube videos, people have harder jobs than you, or any other moronic response someone who thinks it's so easy yet hasn't done it themselves has ever uttered from their drooling, brain-dead troglodyte mouth. I know they just want what's best for me, and are genuinely supportive of me and my career, but when I talk about how unstable YouTube is to people like my parents, they don't get why I keep doing this to myself, and ask me why I don't just quit and suggest getting a stable, regular job with benefits like insurance that actually covers my medications. But as much as I get bitter and curse about YouTube, it genuinely feels like the only thing for me. I can't imagine myself doing anything else otherwise. It has been the only thing to allow me to creatively express myself, even if there are plenty of times, like in the middle of making this video and putting it off for a year and a half, where I feel I will never be able to make something good, of worth, or can be truly proud of. Looking towards those who I hold in high esteem and look up to, like Shichiro Kobayashi, the man who drew all the amazing postcard memories and backgrounds for this anime, or Daisuke Ishiwatari and Keiichi Okabe, who are the biggest reasons I wanted to learn how to play the guitar and piano, or Patrick Seitz, who is my favorite voice actor, wishing that I was even half as good as him, or Shinichi Sakamoto, who drew one of my favorite manga, The Climber, or Kentaro Miura, the man who I think is one of the greatest artists of our generation, and think to myself, I will never make anything even a fraction as good as any of these men. But then a voice deep inside me screams every time, if Marvin Hagler, your goat, your hero, could overcome the prejudice and racism of the boxing world to become one of the most decorated champions of all time, if Michael Bisping could win the championship belt in the UFC with one fucking eye, why can't you do it too? So in spite of all of the negative self-talk, insecurities, and self-esteem issues, I keep making videos, no matter how dog shit, cringe, and embarrassing that I ever think they are. I've said to the worry of those around me that I fully expect myself to put everything I have into making my magnum opus and white whale, the will to struggle, the berserk retrospective, and irreparably damage myself in the pursuit of making it or killing myself trying, going in with the thought that this very well could be the last video I ever make, and being completely satisfied and content with that being the case. Like Joe, if I was a smarter and less prideful man, I would have just coasted for the rest of my my days making bullshit garbage videos that have been proven to work and make me a lot of money, allowing me to live much more comfortably than I do now. Instead, I chase after what I truly desire and make things that make me happy and allow me to express myself even if it leaves me in financial hardship and massive amounts of stress. To put it simply, the Berserk retrospective is something that must be perfect. I will not allow it to be anything else otherwise. Like Joe, this is the thing ever calling to me something that has me chasing after it like a man possessed. It's my phantom of Rikishi haunting me, and it's simply how I've always gone about making videos. I usually only make a video about something if it has burrowed their way into my brain to the point that it is all I can think about. Making these videos is the act of exorcism of my desire to not shut the fuck up about these things to people, but the Berserk retrospective is on a whole other level from anything else I've made before. This is my fight to climb into the ring for, and it is calling me every 
every second of every day, even though I feel I do not have the skills or know-how to achieve my true vision. But regardless, I still march towards it, even if the steps forward are not as fast as I wished they were, continuously saying to myself and on Twitter, this is the year I finally make the video for the past four fucking years, and regardless if the path is not as clear, easy, or as short as I want it to be, I will reach my goal, and it will be perfect. While this half of the video is supposed to be about the negatives and ugly truths about boxing the sport, the drive and cost of ambition, and how you have to ruin yourself in their pursuit, I can't help but still find Joe's struggle and ultimate choice to be anything other than beautiful. I genuinely tear up every time I see this scene of Joe telling Kim how much Rikishi meant to him and why he is the reason he keeps getting up in this fight. I have felt for many years now that my tomorrow was taken from me due to the unfair events of life, leaving me with injuries, illnesses, having not been at the right place at the right time to get into something, or finding out what truly interests me too late. Which feeds into giving up on everything I've ever wanted to pursue, but to some extent, this is nothing more than a coping mechanism I'm using as an excuse to not fully pursue the things that I want for myself because I am scared of failure. And one of the biggest things that has helped me realize this and take the first steps in pursuing my dreams regardless is the stories and journeys of boxing, its competitors, and its media.